Hey, small business people and lovers of good stories in general. Welcome to episode 25 of Small Business War Stories. And this episode is with Matt Ike of Mule Resophonic, who is the founder of Mule Resonator Guitars, that's M-U-L-E. And this episode was special to me because it was a northernmost point of the Soul of America tour. So I left Austin, Texas, I drove through, and I went all the way up to Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, I had never been to Michigan before, and it was a really cool experience uh, to, to see that. And uh, I, w- I stayed up in Bay City that night, which is a little bit further north than Saginaw. But then from then, I, I, I dropped, cascaded down through you know, Detroit and some episodes that have already been published there. And, uh, and then Ohio, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, and back to Texas. So it was uh, – the, the, Matt was really cool because he was kind of a, you know, an anchor point for my tour. And I sought him out because he not only makes amazing instruments and amazing um, – uh, has a really good vibe about him, but also he publishes uh, blog posts that are really interesting about uh, philosophy and business and basically how to um, be your own person and, and succeed. And so I found that really compelling and I was really excited to interview him and sit down with him uh, in his uh, shop in Saginaw. And it was, uh, I learned a lot and I actually ended up walking out of there, uh, with a commitment to buy one of his guitars, which you'll see at the end, at the very end of the show there. Uh, I have no shortage of guitars at the moment, but, uh, his guitars just sound and feel amazing. They have a lot of soul. So even if I have to get rid of a couple, okay, that probably won't happen, but, uh, yeah, I, it's still very much worth it. And, um, this episode, again, as part of a Soul of America tour is brought to you by Impact Crates. Impact crates are the crates that I traveled with with my dog, Muddy Waggers. They're strong, safe, and secure. And they're these amazing collapsible crates that you can basically carry uh, in and out of the car by yourself. Um, and even like a relatively large crate was made of aluminum, so it's easy to carry. Uh, they're uh, very uh, good for your dog for going on long distance trips uh, to keep them safe in the car. If you use code MUDDY20, M U D D Y, to zero, you will get 20% off your impact crate because impact crates is awesome. And so is Muddy Waggers, my puppy that came with me on the trip. The episode is also brought to you by Badger Mapping. Badger is the number one app for field salespeople in the Apple App Store. And the app makes it easy for a rep to manage your territory. And I used it to map my route. So I would basically put in all of the points that I needed to go in the Soul of America tour. And it would tell me the best way to do that and to create, craft this loop that I did of the country interviewing folks. If you tell them that you found out about them on Small Business War Stories, they will give you two free months. So make sure you check them out. Badger Mapping. And the episode and the Soul of America tour is also brought to you by Tecovas Boots. That's T-E-C-O-V-A-S. And Tecovas Boots are awesome. They, uh, I wore them every single day of the tour. I was wearing them this morning. And they, I get a lot of compliments on them. And they, they are really well-made, beautiful boots. And they're also very, very comfortable. And they're made uh, with the same standards of quality as boots that cost two to three times as much. They are just able to pass on the savings to you because they don't have retail stores. You can buy them directly at T-E-C-O-V-A-S boots.com, Tecovas boots.com. And like every episode of Small Business War Stories, this one's also brought to you by Proven. Proven is a company I started, and we are a leading small business hiring tool that where you can post your job uh, to over 100 different job sites in one click. And what makes us different is that we're really focused on small businesses. So lots of folks uh, do similar things to what we do, but we really care, and you'll have somebody who's actually answering your phone calls, actually answering your emails, um, helping you with your job descriptions, and we really care about small businesses. That's who we primarily work with. Uh, so we're not like those other job boards that are, you know, um, really big and going after everybody. We are really focused on small businesses. Thousands of small businesses uh, currently use us, and you can uh, do a free trial. Just go to Proven.com, P-R-O-V-E-N.com, and check us out. So without further ado, I want to get into the episode, episode 25 of Small Business War Stories, the northernmost point of the first Soul of America tour. There will be another Soul of America tour coming up. I'll talk more about that in upcoming episodes. And with Matt Ike 
of Mule Rizophonic Guitars. <laughs> Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. And we are live here in Saginaw, Michigan. And I have the pleasure of sitting today with Matt Ike the founder of Mule Resophonic. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Hey, thanks, man. And uh, cheers. We're So yes. <laughs> I brought you some Blackview Porter, which is from Bend, Oregon. My buddy gave it to me. And you, what, tell me about what you uh, what you gave me here. It's a, I have 51K IPA. Yeah, it's 51K from uh, Marquette, Michigan. So nice. It's pretty much as far north as you can get, and it is awesome. That is good. That's very fitting because this is as far north as the soul of America tour gets before now we start working our way back down to Austin. So cheers. Cheers, man. All right. Cheers. Yeah. Favorite <laughs> podcast so far. And we're like 15 seconds into it. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Love it. That's awesome. Um, so we're, we're, we'll talk about quite a few things and, you know, including music and, and how to make guitars and, and the, the business of custom guitar building and what you do. Um, but maybe tell me a little bit more about Mule and how is it that, that you got started? Um, what, what's the, what do you do and what's your story? Um, well, yeah, my name's, uh, Matt Ike and, uh, I own Mule Resophonic Guitars and we're in Saginaw and, uh, I went to a guitar making school right out of high school and that was kind of what I was interested in. Um, and it required the least amount of school possible. <laughs> so I, what I really, I just wanted to get out and work. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to get into the school system anymore. So I went out to uh, Arizona to a guitar making school there and started doing that. And that was 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. And Mule's been around for about four and a half years. So okay. it was, it was kind of a long way getting here, different factory jobs, um, manufacturing stuff. And, uh, there were there was two or three years there at Hudson Dalton Guitars in Virginia, okay. and that was where I really learned kind of the ins and outs of making good instruments. Um, so that was pretty pivotal. And then, uh, yeah, I ended up moving to Chicago um, to help out with some family issues that were happening, and uh, I was working at an industrial supply place. And then the big recession hit, and I lost my job along with you know, a lot of other people. Yeah. And, um, end up moving back to Michigan. It was like, now nah, what do I do? You know? Sure. Um, and, uh, so all I really knew was, uh, and you, you had grown up here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I moved back to Michigan after about 10 years of wandering around. And you grew up in Saginaw proper? Or um, I went to high school in Saginaw. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, um, so I ended up moving back, uh, to this area and, um, yeah, I drove around for a year playing guitar at, you know, random coffee houses and stuff. And yeah. then I saw Kelly Joe Phelps play his resonator up in Traverse City. And I left kind of wondering if I could do that, um, if I could make an instrument like that. So I knew the acoustic guitar part of it, yeah. but I had never cut a piece of metal or anything. So, yeah. so that was kind of the trick. So it kind of started off as like, can I do that? Um, not like, Hey, there's a business opportunity there. It's just like, I didn't know what else I could do. Interesting. So. Why? So Hudson Dalton is a well-known high-end guitar manufacturer and they make mostly acoustic guitars. Yeah. So yep. you could have gone and started making wood acoustic guitars. Why not that? Um, well, I think it was timing really. Um, you know, I, I saw Kelly Joel play and people kind of lost their minds over that guitar like they're shouting questions at him in between songs you yeah. know and so so that kind of um that kind of got like the inspiration going a little bit um because it was something that was traditional resonators have been around since the 30s but it was something that not a lot of people were doing yeah. like almost nobody you know like there's like five people that do this yeah and so um kind of that you know unreachableness like there wasn't someone i could ask like hey what's the jig that you use to do this yeah or, what's the depth of your sound wall or something like that sure there wasn't anyone to ask i had to go into like the garage and figure it out you know right. 
and that that was really enticing <laughs> you know like the did you have any of, background in metal fabrication before no no Zero. i had i had no idea how to cut a piece of metal yeah. t- you know like oh tin snips aren't for tin you know like <laughs> like that sort of thing like what's the difference between welding or soldering or brazing had no idea or laser cutting versus water jet cutting zero clue and okay. so i was trying to gather information from a bunch of different sources cool like, you know so you you have a, a really great blog that talks about uh so i've been you know before we met in person today i've been a reader of your blog where you talk about you talk a lot about discipline you talk a lot about um perseverance you talk a lot about um uh, processes and like yeah. trusting process as opposed to try you know like needing yeah. an outcome right away yeah um how, how did that help you? What came first? Did you develop that philosophy through failing over and over before becoming a success? Or was that something that you had coming into this? Um, I think I think a great deal of the way I think about this came from the 10 years or so I spent um, in factories. Like this was like rubber extrusion. This was plastics. This was industrial supply, you know, and so the processes were so strong and efficient but then that whole time i was like i want to be a guitar maker yeah you know and so kind of that combination of of having those really strong processes combined with 12 hours a day standing at a rubber press thinking about being a guitar maker i think the confluence of those two things ended up where oh now i'm actually a guitar maker i use those 10 years of experience from factory work to to do this okay so a lot of that that uh, philosophy and that discipline comes from that time oh totally yeah oh yeah i mean i've i've started work at you know 6 30 every day for the last five years yeah and that's being self-employed you know like i took i took a friday off three weeks ago and that was like the first time where I was like, you know what, I'm just not going to come to work today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I've taken vacation. Well, sometimes of, you have to, right? Oh, t- for sure. And so um, I think that having that discipline comes from that that kind of experience um, previously. And I think that's a really powerful thing. I think a lot of times people get into um, making stuff or arts or being self-employed because they want to be free to do whatever it is that they want to do. Sure. But the, I think the success is in the balance of any two things. And so a lot of times people are way over on either side. Either you're so robotic and mechanical that you don't make anything new and worthwhile. Right. Or you're just so freewheeling enough that you're going to make whatever you want to make, even if nobody wants to buy it. Sure. You know, and now you're not successful. Yeah. Because you're just doing whatever you want to do. Yeah. You know, and that's not that's not a mature perspective to have. That's a very childish way of doing it. The difference between genius and insanity is that genius has limits, right? Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. That constraint is a really powerful thing. And a lot of times people want to like push off constraint as like, well, I don't want to be limited. Yeah. No, it's, it's not limitation. It's focus. If you can do anything you want, whatever you want, and you end up doing nothing. Right. You know, and I think that's a really beautiful part about being a guitar maker in particular is, um, there's there's constraints to guitar, you know, like to guitars. If someone if someone is playing something that is just insane, it's a distraction. Yeah. If it's crazy fancy wood or a crazy design, it's a distraction, and that's not the point. Right. You want to make something that is inspiring to the player, and the audience doesn't really notice it. Yeah. You know, it, and that's success to me is inspiring the player and then getting the heck out of the way. That's you awesome. Know? That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit since you bring it up about the actual process of, of making a guitar. So you are, you are not, you're kind of a semi custom guitar maker, right? Because you have like certain parameters and you give people options. So every instrument is unique and it's made with that player in mind. Uh, but it's not like I can come and ask you to make something that is made out of copper and that right. is, uh, you yeah. Know, so. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a similar way. Like it is a custom guitar. You have, options but they're very limited options you yep. know it's steel or brass or it's a single cone or a tricone mm-hmm. um and i think in that way too having that constraint for the people who want to buy an instrument they come to you you're the professional right yeah if you say well it is whatever you want they don't know right. they don't know what you do this yeah. isn't hanging on the wall you sure. have to be the professional so when i say 
these are the best options that I've discovered in the 300 guitars that I've made. They're not going to argue with you. Yeah. That's what they want. Yeah. They want you to decide. This is what this is the music I play. What do you think? Here's right. what I think. Perfect. Cool. That's it. Not, you know, you, you walk through the grocery store aisle and you see a hundred different types of salad dressing. Yeah. It's like, it's just bewildered. I just want salad dressing. That's it. I just want one. Okay. You know, it's the same thing with, with um, instruments. It's the same thing with anything. Makes you can sense. get swallowed up by decisions. Makes you know? sense. Cool. Uh, so tell me maybe like from the moment that somebody, you have currently your backlogs about 10, 12 months or something like that. Yeah. So if somebody were to put a deposit today, Tell me like the entire process from soup to nuts. How does it work? The, the whole process of making a guitar. Um, yeah. So if someone was to put down a deposit today, um, you know, they'd send an email and I would email them back, you know, and that, I think that kind of starts kind of the unique experience of buying a guitar from a person, yeah. you know, is like that starts the communication. Um, and then, you know, during that wait time, people are kind of, um, you know, figuring out from videos and, uh, you know, listening uh, what they want. And then when it comes time to start their instrument, I'll email them and then we'll talk about the details and then confirm them. Yeah. And then um, when we start the guitar, uh, we send semi-daily build pictures to them. Cool. So like this is, and we always try to include the person making the work with the work. It's not just a pile of metal sitting on the bench. It's like Phil hammering the flange. You know, it's me carving the neck, and that and that way it's like connecting people to the thing. Sure. It's not just the thing. This isn't a thing that you just go in a guitar shop and pull off the shelf and you're inspired by. It's about Matt, Phil, and Smithers yeah. making this instrument. And so those pictures, I think, really help. Like so it's like the connect. soul, connect with the soul. Oh, of the guitar. totally. The person, yeah. This is, this is not about the guitar as much as I think people think it is. I think it, at least for me personally, I think this is a mechanism for people to connect around something. Okay. You know, and I think I think making things is a mechanism for learning things about life about you know, all sorts of metaphysical stuff. Yeah. But this this is a way for people who are inspired by similar things to connect. I do something, you do something, both of these things work together. Right. Now we're, you know, doing this. You do podcasts about small businesses. I'm a small business. Right. Now we're here doing this thing. This sure. is now bigger than me. It's now bigger than you. Sure. That's a really powerful thing in a time where we don't have that connection to other people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think it's a, you know, the reason I'm doing this, it's, I think it's a, we have a lack of, I mean, there are, there are some, but we don't have enough storytellers. So yeah. I, I'm going around driving 3000 yeah. miles to, oh, dude. you know, help people tell their Just stories. Just show up. Yeah. Do it for the story. Yeah. You know, like you have to do things. All of this stuff that we do as people, like those are the mechanisms where it's not just Facebook ranting or talk. It's you getting in a car with your dog and beer and showing up at people's places. It's much different experience than just here's the questions I emailed you and, and then, can you type me out a response and I'll yeah. do whatever. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, we have Muddy Waggers here taking a good a good nap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the puppy, he's, he's been he's been quite a few of these. Yeah, <laughs> he's heard all these questions before. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I'm gonna go he's take like, a nap in another room. That's why that's why he's taking a nap. He's like, yeah. fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, cool. So let's maybe talk about like the process a little bit more. So you, how do you balance tradition and innovation in building these guitars? For example, I mean, mm -hmm. Resonators, uh, you know, Sunhouse was kind of probably the big first name, right? But Bucka White and yeah. like a bunch of these guys like in Mississippi were playing uh, metal resonators and juke joints because pre-amplification, yeah. that's the only way you could cut through the mix and cut through, uh, cut through all the people that were drinking and dancing. So how do you... How is the process that you use today to make a resonator similar or different than something that maybe uh, National would have done in the 1930s? And yeah. what, how do you balance that tradition and innovation? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. We were just talking about that today in regards to a few different things. Um, and, and that, I think, was something, probably the most important thing that I learned at Hudson Dalton, too, was um, that balance. They build um, traditional guitars when when someone says guitar the models of guitars that they make yeah. is what pops into your head they do it differently though and in in pretty imperceptible ways you know like 
the rosette is the same style. It's a little different. Um, there's some construction things inside the body that are done a little bit differently. But when you look at it, that's what you expect. Yeah. And and I think that building what you expect building what others expect that's part of your service as a maker mm -hmm. it's not you caving to a market you know it's you being a service to a guitar player this is what they want you are in a position to build that so in regards to the resonators um you know the body shape that i use is a traditional resonator shape yeah it has f sound holes it has a single cone cover plate it's a chicken foot cover plate just like you expect I think what I saw when I started was a lot of resonator makers who had started building resonators that weren't anymore. And what I thought at the time, the reason for that was, was they all had like lightning bolt sound holes mm. or it was a their own body shape, you know, that they had like drawn up. Sure. So it wasn't what people expected. They would say, oh, look, that's cool. The cover plate's a hubcap. That's awesome. That's very creative. But they don't want that. That's not what they expected. They're not going to spend money on it. Yeah. Um, and so, so the way that I do that is that traditional body shape, the F hole, the sound hole. Now, the way I make it different is the material choices. You yeah. know, like the stainless steel. Um, there's some construction things inside the guitar that you wouldn't know. Like if you looked inside the guitar, you probably still couldn't even tell. Right. You know. But that's. That's me thinking about the resonator in a different way. I think about it more like an acoustic guitar, where traditionally the resonator was designed specifically so that the resonator cones are what's doing the most vibrating. Right. And so the rest of the body is built like, hey, we have these cones in here. We want the body. So it's almost to... like a housing for the cone as opposed exactly. to a vibrating. We're going to build this very reg rigid framework so that the cones can vibrate. And I don't think about it like that. I'm right. trying to get the back moving and I'm trying to get the back tensioned a little bit more specifically than just yeah. gluing in a bunch of biscuits yeah. to support a sound well. Okay. Um, so, so I approach it as like doing it different, like functionally yeah. first that it has a different support system so that I can now affect the tone differently yeah. through the inside. But on the outside, other than the patina, it's not really any different. Right. You but know? you're putting a lot, paying a lot of attention. And actually, a lot of folks, if you do look up the reviews for these kind of guitars, they, they talk about that. They talk about how it has a different sound that's mm -hmm. full, yeah. that has a great tone. And, and also, a lot of people who are fairly well known, so Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys, and uh, Adele's uh, guitarist and a few other folks. Uh, I was, we were just talking about Charlie Hicks and Charlie yeah. Parr. They have shown a preference for your guitars because of that tone and that resonance. Yeah, and I think what's really important to note too is that, like, I mean, I've owned twenty guitars. You know, all guitars are different. Yeah. And that was that was how I approached resonators. Was I wanted to make something different? You know, there was. There was really kind of one game in town for a lot of years, yep. and that was the sound. That was it. And acoustic guitars are not like that. Every everyone has a sound, you yeah. know. And so I wanted to contribute something different. I'm not here to say my guitars are like, you know, the loudest or the bassiest or the warmest or anything. Yeah. It is. It's just what I build. Yeah. And if you're down with that, cool. If you're not, there's like so many awesome guitars out there yeah. that you can like go and find. It doesn't have to yeah. be mine. I'm not here to try to sell you that you, this is the guitar you've been waiting your whole life for. Right. It's just what I do. You just want to put it out there for those people who have been searching for that sound to find it. Yes, absolutely. And I think a lot of times too, because the resonator thing hasn't really been done. It's really fun for me because people don't know yeah. that that's what they were kind of like, missing or looking for right and and that i think like we talked about with the connection yeah when that happens it's pretty awesome for sure man. you know because it's a really special thing so. yeah and I, i've spent 15 minutes playing a few of your guitars out there and they had they do have a really special sound it's a very it's like uh it's it has a metallic tone but it's like a sweet resonance beyond yeah. that metallic tone it doesn't sure. sound just like that you know like a tin yes. can you know yes. what i mean yeah it's not a, it's not the trash can the junkyard dog 
there's there's something else going right. on in there. And yeah, but you can still hear the junkyard dog in the background, you know, yeah, you, especially yeah, when you, you put the slide es- in. You can't escape a giant steel body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, so the junkyard, the, is that. the junkyard dog is definitely hidden yeah. in there. It's just, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a real sweet junkyard dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. Um, I mean, I'm sure it, being in the business of music, which, uh, you know, a few of our guests have been in the business of music, uh, I'm sure you see a lot of odd, wacky things. What are, what are some like odd, wacky stories that come to mind that you've uh, come across? Yeah, um, I think in the beginning, um, I was starting to realize like how wrong people could go with their instruments. Like once they got them, and how so? Like uh, there was this was probably a guitar number like somewhere in the 30s. Okay. So this was like in the second year okay. and what uh, before you continue what guitar are you on now um 270 got it okay yeah cool. so so it was a while ago yeah. you know and um and this guy got his guitar and he broke the truss rod and uh because <laughs> he was he was thinking that he could adjust the action with a truss rod, which yeah. is a no no. Well, please, podcast world, do don't do that. Yeah, but, but it's a it. common misconception. It is. When I was it fifteen, is. I thought that was the case too. Yeah. Now that I'm an amateur guitar maker myself, I understand a little bit better about the dynamics. Oh and yeah, like you'd what be surprised how many like and... repair guys don't really understand. You right. know, like the whole neck relief thing. Yeah. Um. It, so he was he was cranking on the truss rod and broke the truss rod nut off. And so I was you know, just like, not a problem. Ship it back to me, and I will fix it for you. Because that's uh, very kind of you. <laughs> like, well, I, you know, and people would say that too. Is like because I've run into situations like that. Yeah. Road, but people will say, oh, "Well, that's very kind of you. That's not your fault. That's his fault, et cetera, et cetera." This is not about whose fault it is. Yeah. This is about one. I hate to say it, but it's about winning. It's like, what's the bigger picture here? Yeah. The bigger picture is this guy messed up his guitar. I can fix it. And if I don't, regardless of how I explain it to him, he's going to think it's my fault. Right. And and if you do, he's probably going to be an evangelist for the rest of his life. And that every single time that has happened, they always become an evangelist. Yeah. There's one guy who a uh, uh, similar thing had happened and i fixed his guitar and he 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 at every opportunity is vocally supportive of what i do because people don't expect that they expect some backhanded comment like well this is your fault but i guess i could maybe kind of sort of help you but if all you say is ship me the guitar i will fix it i'll refund your shipping here's my address there's no discussion nothing then you're a hero yeah. And that's the bigger picture is I want to be that hero. It works out for them. It works out for me. Yes, there is some, you know, kind of begrudgingness there. Um, but it's it, not nothing that a 51K IPA from Marquette, Michigan oh, can yeah. fix. I go for the heavier stuff. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when, it's, when it comes to replacing a trust rod, yeah. I just like. It's more like an I'm, imperial oh, style. Oh, oh I'm of. all in. I'm all in. Yeah, so that guy shipped his guitar back to me, and not only was the truss rod broken, but the neck had been carved, like he had carved the neck, and the wood was completely bare on the back, and there were two Phillips head screws in the headstock to like, like the strings were like... Like string trees? Like like string trees, oh. yes, on either side. And that was never mentioned. All we had talked about was the truss rod. And I got this guitar back. And it was like, there's Phillips head screws in the headstock. The neck is carved. And the truss rod is broken. And I was like, What is this shit? Like, like this was so just commonplace to him. He didn't even think to mention it. So my email back to him was, "Um, I noticed that the the neck had been carved. Would you like me to refinish that for you? (laughs) You So, oh, would, that, would you like to keep your Phillips uh, Home yeah, Depot right, yeah, string exactly. trees? <laughs> would you like me to replace those with stainless steel Phillips yeah. head screws? <laughs> you know? um, but, you know, I have gotten in situations where me and a customer would have to have a discussion. Yeah. Um, because, honestly, like, no, if something, something like warranty happens, nobody feels worse than I do. You know, like... Like we are on an even page. Like I stay up at night thinking I want this to be cool for you because yeah. again, like this is about the person. This isn't just about a guitar. Like I feel, I feel very badly. 
But sometimes when you can, it's very easy to tell when someone's trying to put one over on you and when someone is like, hey, Matt, uh, this happened. I'm like, I will fix that for you. But do you have people put try to put one over on you? I would say out of 300 customers, I've had two. Two. Yeah, I. What do they do? Three. I've had three. One was um, one was a repair guy. Well, he, he worked at a guitar store and he had a repair guy um, uh, work on the instrument and he didn't understand that the truss rod um, works backwards. So on a national, on older nationals and on these and on really any guitar with a double action truss rod without a truss rod cover, they work opposite of normal. Oh okay. shit! I didn't now, know about that. Yeah, I it, could mess that up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you okay. Tell me? <laughs> well, and that's fine. Like, it's a very easy thing to notice if you're paying attention. So, if you're measuring what ha- what's happening, you could see it with your eyes. You don't even have to like look at it. If you turn the tr- if you turn the truss rod one one way, and the neck does the opposite of what you expect, don't keep doing that thing that you're sure. doing. So this repair guy kept doing that thing that he expected he should be doing so he was trying to go clockwise so we get flatter exactly without paying attention to it and so so then your truss rod doesn't have a cover so is it accessible from the from the sound no it's from the it's from the headstock now the reason the reason that's done is so that that slot can be smaller okay so that you don't need to use a truss rod cover because all my headstocks are slot heads oh and so it's really it's really hard to put a a truss rod cover on it that looks good it gets aesthetically kind of crowded it's it's you have this really nice, aesthetically pleasing headstock, and then you put a giant piece of whatever on there. It yeah. just looks weird. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't do it that way. And so we, we kind of had this back and forth where I was trying to, I was trying to understand what was happening in their situation. And I got, well, I've been around guitars for 35 years you know, you don't need to tell me how to, and I'm just, I'm just asking questions because this, we're doing this remotely, yeah. you know, like yeah. I have to understand what's happening. Sure. So I got the, I got the guitar back and took it out of the case and the neck was completely backbowed. So it was just buzzing. And I turned the truss rod a half turn the other way and it was fine. And that was after I refunded him his money because it made, he, there was this huge issue yeah. and this and that, it was like, all it took was a half turn the other way and it was okay. And that was really my first experience. So what you kept that one? Um, yeah, I well, I kept that one, and then I ended up selling it because okay. it was completely fine. Yeah. Now, that was one of the early guitars too, and so here I shipped this guitar to this big shop out in New York City, and then then there's this huge situation in my mind where I'm being accused of something and. I I knew for a fact before I got that guitar back that yeah. I had messed up big time because this was from the shop. I mean, I felt sick to my stomach, yeah. right? So then I got the guitar back and then lo and behold, it's totally fine. And that was really eye-opening to me that I was like, oh, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Like I'm not, I don't have to be subject to you know yeah. other people's and opinions you're not going to please everybody right so that's, right and exactly. it's, a lot of people sometimes uh i mean some folks are remaining unnamed in the music industry try to like ride their uh prestige just a little too hard you oh know? for sure so yeah uh, yeah definitely and so you know um i i think it's just like with anything like like we had talked about earlier is when you start you suck at everything yeah and along the way you stop sucking and then you start being decent and then you start being good and there's n- nobody around to tell you that except your own realization That's and so it's hard to shift gears so, where yeah. it's like okay no i'm i'm a professional now this is the tool i should buy not this one or I am the professional now because of the experience that I've had. Yeah. So when someone says this is the way, I can say it's not actually the way. And I can say that with some element of authority. Yeah. You know, and but also an element of empathy where you're able to say that. Like there's a yeah. there's a further art in being able to communicate that without being confrontational and righteous. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think and I think you know 
in those situations, you know when you're dealing with someone who's receptive. Yeah, we're to doing that. we're doing a two beer podcast. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cheers. Yeah. 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 So um, <laughs> so we uh, um, we know when we're dealing with someone who also is responsive to that yeah. empathy, and then you also know when you're dealing with someone who just wants to get fired up about something. Right. And people I, do. People are addicted to outrage. Oh, a hundred percent is and and I think. I think what's so much more powerful, obviously, is that conversation. Is like we as human beings are so e- so um, uh, so easily we can find both sides of the coin. Yeah. You could you could propose an idea to me right now, and yeah. I could find both sides of the coin just like that, yeah. never having thought about it before. But there's no there's no power in saying this is why this would not work. Right. The power is finding that balance, and you only get there through conversation. Makes sense. You know, is that's how you flesh that out. Is like, oh, this is how you ride that line. Yeah. Is this is the marker that you could set up to make sure that you're not going too far either yeah. way. And it's really rare that you find someone who's open to like, okay, here's the two sides. How do we figure out how to ride that line? Right. And also focusing like. It's interesting you said earlier about what winning means, right? And often winning is actually not being right, right? So like like you said with your customer, that that uh, you know had they had screwed up and broken the trust rod. Yeah. Even though you were right, quote unquote, the way to win that was by yeah, not being right. For sure. And I think I think both of those things can coexist. I can be right. Yeah. And I can also be your hero. Right. You know, like I don't have to say, yes, you were correct in breaking that trust rod, <laughs> but I can answer another question mm-hmm. and I can be like, I will fix this for you. The end. Sure. I don't have to everyone. Oh, I, with all my suppliers, you know, I'll if something doesn't get shipped or I don't get an email yeah. and I say, hey, where this stuff is, you always get that backhanded email where it's like in my email from Wednesday of blah blah blah. Yeah. I noted that you know this and this. Yeah. Okay, you don't have to say that. I didn't see the email. I didn't get the email. You never sent the email. But you don't have to say, well, this is really your fault, and yeah. I'm also responding. You're answering Just the wrong leave question. Just leave that out. Yeah. Just leave it out. Be the professional. Yeah. All this needs to do is get fixed. Yeah. And then you're my hero. You know, this will get shipped out today. Perfect. You're talking about suppliers, so. You wrote a great blog post about what to de- what to accept and not accept from suppliers, right? And how to deal with people. Yeah. Um, Don't be a hostage. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about that. So a lot of small business folks have suppliers. I yeah. certainly have suppliers. A lot of like most of the people I know have suppliers. And this is a common problem. So how do you maybe just to, uh, without going into like the whole blog post, which is a great post, uh, <clears throat> what's your philosophy on dealing with suppliers and, and the whole hostage thing? Um, I would say... Um, going into any situation, it's integrity. Mm-hmm. Integrity is doing what you say you're going to do. Yeah. So in any situation, stuff comes up. I stuff comes up for me. You know, it's the, everybody. But time and time again, someone will say, "Thank you for your order. This will ship out Tuesday. Tuesday comes. Order not shipped. I will email them the following week. Where's this order? Oh, sorry." My grandma had to go to the hospital. I wasn't able to do that. My dog ate my homework. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's the proximity excuse. It's not that your grandma got sick yesterday. It's that you didn't ship it on Tuesday. Yeah. You have to go further back. So they'll say, well, it'll ship out on Wednesday. Wednesday comes, doesn't get shipped. Now that's an integrity issue. And, And that's when you have to really think about like, this is not the supplier for you. They're holding your your business hostage, you are subsidizing their business. You gave them money. Yep. They took this as a month loan. Yeah, it's working capital. It, exactly. I have this money in my bank account yeah. that I can use now, yes. but you don't have your stuff. And actually, that's a big thing for small business owners. Sometimes you don't think about that. The fact that like the cost of capital means that having cash out to a supplier mm-hmm. or inventory on the shelf yeah. means that you're basically not using yeah. that money for your business. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think... The, the biggest part of that is what that does, and that's why I said don't be a hostage, is what it does is it limits your ability to make decisions. If if I email someone and say, can't I have money, can you do this? They say, yes, I can. I go, okay, 
all my eggs are now in your basket. Here's my money. Now you can't do it. Yeah. Well, if you just said, no, I can't do that in this timeline, I go find someone else. Yeah. Totally cool. This is the world. But don't you dare tell me you can get this done and then not do it. And yeah. then I ask you about it and then you don't do it again. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big issue because now it's an integrity yeah. thing. For me and, and a lot of these business things, it's more like it's a, all these things are like a one-time game. Where, yeah. people, where people like I'll give anybody a chance, but yeah. if then if they screw you over, you just don't deal with them again. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I, I end up having like a two day window where I'll email someone and I leave it the next day and yeah. then I email them again. You have to have yeah. a timeline for that because you can't push it off. Yeah. Like so much, so much of being like a small business person is being efficient with your decisions. That was how Mule got started was I don't know how to do this. I need to acquire information in the next hour yeah. and then I have to buy this tool or try this thing and then move on. Yeah. You can't sit and ponder. You can't put it on the back burner. There's not time for that. You you need to live your life. You need to run yeah. your business. And if suppliers are taking that hostage by you having to email them five times to get you know, a, a shot bag or a file or something. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It, it should be right there on the shelf. Take it off the shelf. Put it in the box. Yeah. If not, they lied to you. Yeah. If not, they just tell me you don't have it. Exactly. Yeah. Then I move on. Easy. This is exactly how it goes. So I think, like to anyone listening, I think what you can do is be as informative in your initial email as possible. I have this thing I need done. I would also like it to ship next week can you do that right otherwise it's ambiguous so if you can remove that ambiguity also sometimes depending on the situation i've said um like like if it doesn't ship by friday i'll check back in with you to see what the status is right to know like hey i'm not going away you know and <laughs> um like i'm gonna check back in with you right so don't just forget about me and and yeah if there's if they're being a wait you gotta cut it. It's yeah. not worth it. You know, um, my my laser cutting guy. I pay more money for him because I could I could text him right now and I get a I get a response to him in five minutes. Yeah. Every time for the past four years, yeah. it's been like that. And he has a laser cutting business. Yeah. Yeah. He's in Detroit. Yeah. Saying. PTM. Okay. So if anyone maybe for maybe laser, I'll interview him. I'm on my way to Detroit oh, right dude. now. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. Jason is. I mean, lifesaver. In the beginning, when no one wanted to pay attention to me because yeah. I was ordering one set at a time or two sets at a time, yeah. he was like, I like guitars. I can do this for you. And he had no business like helping awesome. me at all. That's awesome. So, yeah, I'll give him money until the day I die. You know. And those are the kind of relationships that by doing, by basically being consequential, you can forge, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like I said, it's a matter of integrity. Jason has always done what he said that he's going to do. Yeah. You know, and that's priceless. Let me flip that around on you. Have you ever had to, let's say that somebody put a deposit on a guitar today. Have you ever had to delay a, uh, uh, a shipment to a customer? Yeah. In the beginning, um, that was one of my biggest mistakes is we all suck at estimating. Yeah. You know, when you say like, We're hey, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to put a new floor in yeah. my house. I could do it, you know, probably in a month of weekends. <laughs> nope. Like, it, it's going to be winter. <laughs> like, you better find a new place to live in the meantime because yep. it's just impossible. So in the beginning, um, things took off pretty quick. Yeah. And that was really surprising to me because after 13 years of working in factories, building guitars and basements, oh, and now it's working. So... Like, let's say, for example, I had 40 guitars, and that was like, let's say, 10 months of guitars. Sure. Okay. Um, I would I would say, okay, the wait would be 12 months. It's not 12 months. Okay? Not when you're one, one person. So in the beginning, we would get to that, that point where it's like you were trying to estimate over a year um, of wait time, and I'd screwed that up, and so there would be a delay. So now... I've I've built in a buffer. So when when I say it's 10 months, there's really like 7 months of guitars, you know. That way that way there's that buffer time because I know stuff is going to come yeah. up. And when when you email someone and it's a month early, now you've exceeded their expectations. Under promise over deliver. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so it's a fair way of going about it. Now, I also swung 
too far the other way because I used to add five months of um, buffer time. Mm. And we got to the point where it'd be like, hey, your guitar is ready to start. And they're like, whoa, don't have the money for it. And so so it is a very fine line because you can't go too far the, you know, either yeah. way. Because your um, guitars, I mean, you you charge about two thousand dollars for a guitar. Yeah, base price is twenty three hundred. Yeah, so. and then you add options from there depending yeah. on what you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, it you wrote something really interesting, and in, in, I think it was either your website or your blog. Over that, over time, your price has gone up because it reflects the experience that you have in guitar making. Yeah. So that's that's really interesting because I felt two ways with that when I read that. I felt like, oh, that's awesome. You know, he's yeah. getting better at guitar making. Yeah. And then I felt like. Holy shit! What about those early people? Did that mean that they didn't get as good a guitar? So how yeah. do you kind of like handle that? It's scary as hell, right? Yeah, you're never you're never going to be as good as you are tomorrow. Yeah, and that was the biggest hurdle I had to overcome in the beginning. So so I lost my job. I wandered around for two years playing music. Yeah. Um, then had this idea for guitars, built four of them, and ran out of money. I had like a thousand dollars left and had to start working at a factory. So then um, it was like I'm swinging engine blocks back in Saginaw, Michigan. Yep. And I was like this close, there, you know. There's a song somewhere there. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so then I worked there for two weeks and I had twelve orders. And it was like I could make more money making these guitars than I could at this engine place. So I quit. But now you're in this position where now you have to build something for somebody and then you have to accept their money for it, knowing that it's still a work in progress. There is no other choice. You can't wait. You, you, it's like putting out your first CD. It will always be the first CD. It will always be the CD that you... I am struggling kids. with that personally Dude, right now with my own EP. Like it's with my own it's songs. the exact same thing. Yeah. And uh, like you said, it's like... like we all do different things and it's all the same. Yeah. It's the same thing. It will always be the first CD. It will it will never be the CD that you wished your we first CD. I put out a CD, okay? Yeah. It's hidden away on Bandcamp <laughs> for a good reason. <laughs> it's the same thing, yeah. you know? And and so there was no other choice. Okay. And so when I raised the prices, like again, it was like how do you how do you value this instrument? Yeah. Like how how do I assign a number? So in the beginning, I decided that price based on um, they were eleven hundred dollars to start. Mm -hmm. So that was that I made like one hundred and fifty dollars on a guitar, yeah. and that was like the lowest I could go. And so then after every ten guitars, I think I upped the price like two hundred and fifty dollars or yeah. something. Um, it probably wasn't that much. But that was just like the only mechanism I could come up with that was like a real thing. Yeah. I have built more guitars, therefore it shall be worth more money. Yeah. And then if if I raised it too much or I raised it too little, then I could alter it. But I had to do something. So somebody buying a mule ten years from now will likely pay more than you would today. Um, ten years probably. Yeah, we're we're kind of at the price point where I want to be though. Okay. Yeah, I I don't want to raise it anymore. Then it starts getting into a different thing if you're paying yeah. four thousand dollars for a guitar you're approaching it a little bit different than a two thousand dollar guitar sure and i and i i can't tell you how many um surprise birthday presents 50th anniversary presents retirement wedding gift i get from people and yeah. i really love that yeah and so i really want to keep it around that price so that people are still able to do that it's a way to connect with the soul of it's um oh it's amazing i mean to get pictures from someone like when they're like fiance opens up the guitar case yeah. or it, it's i mean yeah. it's awesome so um yeah maybe, maybe someday i'll find a fiance that will buy me a meal yeah <laughs> man oh my gosh it's i i mean i've probably done like 30 guitars like that that's where awesome. it's like it's a surprise so you know don't tell them don't and then tell we, have them. To, we have to like somehow figure out the options that's and cool all of that stuff that's so, cool yeah <laughs> you look like yeah yeah if our listeners could see you you look like a kid in a candy store like oh, hold, holding on to your beer so oh, happy <laughs> oh it's amazing it was the most unexpected thing about doing this yeah. because i uh, you know part of the reason i put off really making a go of it was i didn't want to sit in my shop for the rest of my life by myself yeah yeah i'm not that type of person and so i didn't want to like subjugate myself to this life of yeah you know whittling wood by myself in my shop yeah 
but it's not like that. Well, you have a cool vibe in the shop, you know, and you have crazy fuckers from Texas that drive all the way up to Saginaw oh, to dude. talk to you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Minnesota, uh, New Hampshire. Yeah. Um, people will come by, and then the people who can't, I mean, they sent, like, the beer you're drinking was sent by a customer. Nice. Um, I have a whole shelf of stuff. This guy, uh, we're going to start his guitar in a couple weeks. He's sending us lobster. Nice. You know, he's from Maine. From, he's from Maine. Nice. And he lives on this little island off the coast of Maine, and three out of his four sons fish, and he wants to send us lobster. Like, what the heck? Yeah. Like, I never would have thought that that, that would happen. That's awesome. And so it is, a, it is really about the people. And That's cool. And it's bigger than the guitars. So. Cool. So you, you're you sort of like so – you, not only are you a great luthier and, and business person, but you're kind of like this uh, – you have all this sagely, like, sto <laughs> stoic business advice. You're like, uh, you know, a luthier with, like, a touch of uh, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. So, like, what what would you be, what would you say? You, you've had so many great uh, lessons already, but what would you say is your number one lesson or piece of advice to small business owners out there? Um, hmm. it, it's, hard to, it's hard to give a ranking in yeah. the moment. I think in the moment... Um, Kind of like what we said, I th there's going to be two things. Is one, constraints are not limitations. Okay. Okay. Whatever it is you choose to do, you are there as a service to whoever it is that might purchase it. You have to provide them with something that they want, period. Okay. This is the essence of being a business person. Yeah. It's not about you. You can't do whatever it is that you want. Okay. It's the balance. Okay. And... um. I, you know, I think I think the second thing is it's not about what you do. It's about the people. Like I said, is this is so much bigger than guitars. This is about, like, you here with your dog and the beer and this podcast. Yeah. This is about a dude sending lobster to a bunch of people that he's never met before. Yeah. You know, it's – it's if if all of my – communication online or with customers was about the grain lines per inch of the maple that I use or, <laughs> or, you know, whatever, all of that material stuff that guitar makers just drown themselves in. Yeah. Then it is about just the guitar. It yeah. is about nitrocellulose versus UV curing versus hand rub finish. Yeah. You know, I don't get into that because that's not the point. Yeah. And, and I think if you keep that in the forefront of your mind, then you have a whole shelf of stuff that people send you after they pay you a bunch of money for a guitar. Awesome. And that's way more important. Cool. So, so what do you what do you want to go in the next ten years? So you have, in piecing together your story, you actually have a little bit of a dilemma because if you're going to keep your prices the same, mm -hmm. and then more and more people are uh, using and playing your guitar, yeah. some folks that are high end. Yeah. Your wait is currently ten months. Yeah. So one or two things has to happen. Mm -hmm. Your weight's either going to go to twenty four or forty eight months, or your price is going to go up and keep your weight at ten months. What's it? Where do you where do you want to go in the next ten years? Right now, you touch every neck, you touch every guitar. Yeah. Uh, how how does that? Um, all come well, together? you know, I think that we are where I want us to be. Yeah. Um, I it took me thirteen years to find this shop space, which is awesome. I mean, we're in it a is awesome. we're in a five story warehouse building in Saginaw. Yeah. It's a sixteen hundred square foot shop, fourteen foot ceilings, fourteen inch beams. You know, going through a wood floor, windows. Yeah. After you know a bunch of years of working in basements and garages, sure. this is. Well, no, it's beautiful. For. I mean, this is like a storybook. Even in oh, the, the video that you have in your website, it's like man, a storybook shop. Oh, when I walked in here, uh, John and Terry, who own this building. They like they just wanted to help us, and yeah. I was just like, oh, thank you. And we, I walked in this room. I want to do snow angels on the floor. It was just <laughs> like I was so I was so psyched. Um, so you know, I think in regards to like the pricing and the weight, the weight will go up um, if if people are willing to wait. Um, I don't want to chase people off with the price. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm not going to raise the price, but I, I'm saying that I am trying not to do that. And, um, um, yeah, so it, it is, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, I will, one thing that I want to do is have a position open for, um, Guitar making students who come out of Roberto Venn or, um, that's in Arizona, right? Yeah. That's the one I went to. And, um, 
the biggest hurdle for me in the beginning was getting out of guitar school and kind of having an idea of building a guitar. Yeah. But you don't really have the quantity. You like you just in a school setting you can't have the work quantity that yeah. you need. And then you're kind of like, okay, now what do I do? But I can't make any money building guitars because I don't have any tools. But I don't have any money to build tools. Yeah. So what I would what I would really like to have happen is to have a position open for a guitar banking student who wants to go on and build on their own. Yeah. Are you so, gonna do it? I, I, yeah. Can people apply to you now? N- um, no, they can't apply. I have a guy um, in June that's probably gonna cool. come. He's gonna get graduate Gallup. And that way he can work here. Yeah. He can he can make money doing work for me. Okay. And then he has a whole shop full of tools that he can use to make his jigs and templates and his first few guitars so he can get those crap guitars out of the way because yeah. they will be junk. And um, you, just, you just can't get started doing this. And that's why people start doing repair work. And then, I mean, at least the repair guys that I know, it's kind of this hole that you can't get out of. There will always be repair work. Right. And so you always have money, which means that you can't, you don't really have the time that you can dedicate to guitars. So if this could be kind of like an incubator for people who want to go on and do their own thing and um, use that as a springboard, now that would be super cool. God, I see, we we have to wrap this up soon, but I I do have to ask you because this has come up with quite a few folks that I've met. Mm. There's this dichotomy between people wanting to have help and help other people, but then people are sometimes scared of creating their own competition. How do you approach that issue? I love competition. Um, I know that I know that it might be a little bit different with the resonators because there's not a lot of people doing it. Um, But I know for a fact. And anybody, anyone who started something should also know this. I would think that this is not about knowledge. Okay, I could I could tell you how to build a guitar. Are you gonna do it? Are you gonna spend a year in a fifteen foot by fifteen foot basement of your house cutting up metal and throwing it away? You know, like there is a hurdle um, called effort and yeah. failure. Sure, that is that you know if if i tell you how to do this and you do the and you beat me you've earned it i've said that to people before like anybody i tell people my idea and i'm like if you do this better than i do you deserve to win it's not a it's not about the idea it's about doing it yeah you know everyone says like hey oh i had the idea for the hyperloop like 10 years ago yeah awesome but you're not out in the desert making it yeah. actually doing it sure. it doesn't matter everyone has an idea yeah. you have to do it so um you know training competition you know what um if someone comes in and they leave and they want to build steel resonators you know there there will there would be a part of me that would say like really like yeah you want to do patina resonator guitars now yeah. but you're you're barking up the wrong tree i mean like a, a huge um, a, um, kind of tangent I went on was like, hey, I could go build wood guitars just like everyone else is doing, or I could go build resonators that no one is doing. I'm going to go play my own game. Yeah. And it's the same thing. So so I could tell people like, hey, that's what I did. And then there's going to be a segment of people that go like, oh, yeah, there's nobody building steel resonators. I'll go build steel resonators too. <laughs> no, like there's something else. Yeah. There's there's something there out there that no one else is seeing because everyone is running the same direction. Sure. You know, everyone's going, oh, this is working. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to open up a CrossFit gym. I'm going to make steel resonator guitars. Yeah. I'm going to make bladder brace guitars. There's something else there that yeah. no one else is seeing. Go find that thing. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk about Saginaw for a minute. So it's my first time in Saginaw, Michigan. Actually, it's my first time in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, what's uh, What's it like to b- do uh, business here? What What's the community like? Uh, do you find support from other business owners? Do you find support from government? What's it like to do business? Um, you know, I I I don't I don't want to give the wrong impression. Um, you know, I I have a lot of my people here in Saginaw. That's sure. how I ended up uh, back here. Um, I think with what I do, like with the resonator guitars, is is more global like 
it's a pretty niche thing. Sure. You know, like resonator yeah, guitars. Yeah, you get orders probably from like Japan, oh, Netherlands. Pr- like. You know, we ship, we ship 10 to 12 guitars a month, and I would say four of them are international. Yeah. Okay. Like, no one's really doing this. And if you're a resonator guy, you're a resonator guy. Yeah. And so I've put a lot more effort into trying to connect with people, like through the website, Instagram, um, like the blog and stuff. To, to cast a wider net. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not super involved or as involved as I should be with like the local business community. And that's just my decision. That's yeah. not anybody else's. That's just me. I have, I have a thing that I want to do and I want to connect with all these Rezo players. Sure. Very but you did, you did mention that the owner of this building gave you some, uh, uh, you know, he was helpful in getting you. He, and he, oh yeah. Tremendous. And I was, I was super lucky to find him and, yeah. um, uh, yeah, John, John has helped me a great deal. Cool. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, is there anything else that you want our audience to know about you? Where can people find you? So you're mule resophonic. Uh, what's your website, your Instagram handle? Yeah. Uh, website is mule resophonic.com and, yeah. uh, Instagram is mule resonator guitars. Yeah. And that's really the only two awesome ways well matt you have left me with absolutely no choice but to put down a deposit to get a meal today, <laughs> which is both yeah. amazing and terrifying yeah. uh, because uh <laughs> there's no lack of guitars in my home yeah, but uh, i played one for 20 minutes before and it sounds amazing it feels amazing it's got it's got soul and Thanks, you're man. you're a great man. I really appreciate it. So now I guess we gotta finish these beers and go decide the settings of what it's gonna be. Hey, that's a great way of awesome. doing it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, brother. All right. Thank you for listening to Small Business War Stories. If you enjoy the show, share it with a friend, or you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our blog at blog.proven.com. If you have an idea for us, we'd love to hear it. Please email us at podcast at proven.com. See you next time. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.